we saw that the market was not ready for applying pricing algorithms. Like a magic toolbox where the algorithm can give you the optimal prices and the trust that a person without any background knowledge of your domain can do it. I think then it's the right time to look for an outsourcing. Hi everybody, welcome to the Debeco Breakfast Bar. Here we speak with different people involved in the business landscape, share their expertise, delve into the latest tech trends and explore the ins and outs of IT outsourcing. I'm Oleg Sadikov and today I'm excited to have Arian Ostok, co-founder at Simpson. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss new episodes. Hi Arian and thanks for joining me today. Hi Oleg, yeah, great, have, great being on the, on the show. Thanks for having me. Let's start our podcast with little bleeds. I start the sentence and you continue. Entrepreneurship gave me a lot of intellectual challenge, creativity, pushing boundaries. My main superpower is my emotional IQ, I would say. My main weakness is operational excellence. When I'm afraid, I, I bite on my nails. What inspired you to create Simpson? What market gap were you aiming to fill? Actually, pricing is, is a very specific topic, right? So it's not an I, educated as, as a pricing manager. We started off as a spin-off from the Erasmus University by bringing together the scientific and, and, and the business world. And one of our first customers actually introduced us to, to the pricing topic. They told us that pricing was really driven by a lot of good feeling from, from sales. And they asked us, hey, can we make and apply a scientific model to have a more data-driven approach to, to pricing? So that was for us, I think, a world that's become open. There was a lot of opportunity for AI pricing. On the other hand, I think there was also the, the, the opportunity that customers gave is that there was no software tool yet or a solution yet that was kind of available for, for the mid-market. So pricing still, if you talk about pricing optimization, it's driven by a lot of consultants or driven by a lot of enterprise tools. There is not one tool that is really suitable for, for, for the mid-market. And this is where we saw the gap to create Simpson and to add value for our customers to have a kind of a tool that is affordable for a lot of companies who are in the, in the mid-market. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced while transiting from an idea to a scalable solution? Yes, yeah, one of the biggest challenges was when we first applied our optimization models for our customers, we saw that 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 the model we created actually was a little bit before, I think the it was back in 2018. So we were far before the AI hype and, and data science hype. So when we already had a pricing algorithm that could optimize your prices, we approached a lot of companies, okay, we already proved success for, for some companies that are also interested in working with us. We saw that the market was not ready for applying pricing algorithms. So that was a, was a big challenge we faced, but uh, I think especially since the last four years, data science and pricing and AI pricing become more popular. Yeah, we have everything on our side. How do you approach scalability in SaaS pricing product, especially one that integrates multiple strategies and large data inputs? That, this was also, I think, one of the um, toughest challenges we had in, in, in scaling pricing because pricing processes and, and pricing strategies are so different per industry and per company. So what we made with Simpson is for us, and, and Start is actually the core of our platform, is a price management suite, where we have a drag and drop builder to create your own pricing strategy. And although the pricing strategies for every company are different, we see a lot of similarities between industries and, and companies. And most of our customers can make their whole assortment. So most of our customers are retailers, e-commerce companies, manufacturers or wholesale companies, they have like a product assortment of at least 5,000 products and they can price their whole assortment of products with on average five to seven strategies because the strength of our platform is that you can assign multiple product groups and individual products to one strategy, but you can make a lot of detailed, I would say, exceptions and also different minimum margins on a product group level or on an individual product level. So it makes high level you have your price architecture that's how we call it but on a lower level you can always make all kind of exceptions and you have the flexibility to, to make different settings but high level you work with the same strategies so that's how we approach the scalability even though you have 
a million of products you sell to a lot of marketplaces and a lot of countries you have your core pricing architecture but you always have the flexibility to make changes on, on lower levels and you can easily duplicate them on uh, on different sales channels your algorithms suggest optimal prices based on market behavior how do you balance automation with human insights this comes close to our vision as a company so our vision is that we enable at our customers hyperlearning that's a kind of a, a concept, but we believe hyperlearning is based upon three loops. So we have an organization that has a lot of knowledge about what an optimal price should be. Then we have data and machine learning can tell you, okay, based upon the data, I can show you a suggested price. But the company and the expert that runs Simpson is aware that null, not all data points can be in a model because there's a lack of, of data. And therefore, I think the algorithm and the human expert always work next to each other, where the model can work with a suggestion, a recommendation, but there's always a critical attitude needed from the from the expert. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's not like a magic toolbox where the algorithm can give you the optimal prices and you can sit behind and and and, and lay behind. It's it's yeah, the the expert and the, and, and the model should work hand in hand, and this is what we call hyperlearning, where the more times yeah, you go through this process, the better your your model becomes based upon the feedback of the expert and based upon the machine learning cycles you go through. It. Some common mistakes company make when implementing AI and how can they... Yeah, so I think referring to my previous answer, there could be an expectation that AI will do the magic. And I think that can be sometimes true with, with, with some applications. But especially in pricing, when there's a lot of context needed, yeah, you need a background of, of the context. It's not that the AI in pricing will do the magic. It will do the magic for some part, but you need at least a critical mindset to give feedback to the model to improve it, especially in the beginning of, of the implementation. So that's, I think, an, yeah, a challenge, but also an educational role we have in, in the market. I think that's one. The other one is the mistake you can get is that you start too soon so that people are triggered by the business case. For example, they are triggered by having the algorithm giving recommendations about a margin increase without having, for example, a good process of, of your price. So without knowing, okay, what price should be optimized or what are the variables that need to be included in the model. So starting too soon without having a good structure of your own pricing process is a common mistake. That's for why yeah, we like to start first with structuring your process so that you know which drivers are really influencing the price process or diving into AI optimization. What's your approach to hiring talent in such a disciplinary company? Like yours. So challenges of hiring talent. Yeah, I think for us, it depends a little bit on what kind of job role. But in general, pricing is not something you learn on the university, at least not in the Netherlands. So pricing is, is it's, it's a combination between economics, psychology, data science. And also if you're working in our IT department, of course, you need to, you need the software expertise. But it's, it's something that you learn by doing. So it's not like that we are offered for, for people that have great experience in, in, in pricing. Yeah, so that's why we, we scout them often ourselves from university, educate them, so they have this pricing domain knowledge and understand what's, what's needed to do the job. Are there specific regions or countries that you find particularly promising for tech talent? Yeah, yeah, we are now based in the Netherlands. The majority of our people actually has a background in the Netherlands. So we scout them here from, from the university or they have some relation with the Netherlands. There are not specific countries we, we are currently targeting for, for outsourcing uh, tech or, or hiring our people because we, we like to have people also here. Now, let me rephrase that. I think we have a kind of company culture which is hybrid. Uh, mm -hmm. so most of the people are here two, two days a week in our office, mm -hmm. but we have, on the other hand, uh, also people that work internationally. So we are a little bit agnostic in, in what kind of countries they are, as long as they speak good English and fit our company culture. Being based in the Netherlands, do you notice any unique challenges or opportunities in the tech industry? Yeah, being based in the Netherlands, I think it, it offers us, I think the, the, the infrastructure here is very good. We are close to, to universities that I think are the, the main opportunities. Yeah, however, I think that the challenge is that we have great companies here, but also around the cities, Rotterdam, Amsterdam, The Hague, there are a lot of companies here. So we fishing in, in, in the same pool. Although I think the universities are becoming more and more technical, more into the AI part. So there's the talent pool is also increasing, which is a good, good thing. But yeah, in terms of software development. What are your thoughts on the advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing? Yeah, I think advantages and disadvantages, we are not that experienced with Simpson in, in outsourcing. We have 
done a couple of ex experiences. But as I said, pricing knowledge is very, it's very in-depth and it takes a lot of time to really understand all the concepts of, of, of pricing because there's so many things are involved in. So bringing with all the domain knowledge to a partner makes that, if we talk about future developments in, in software, yeah, it takes a lot of time to, to bring over this domain knowledge. And that's, I think, the disadvantage of, of, of outsourcing that you need very well-defined tasks to bring it over to, to the outsourcing partner. And that's not, all, not always where we have been successful in. In your experience, what are the qualities of a successful outsourcing relationship and what should companies look for when selecting a partner? I think what I already said, if you have a lot of well-defined projects uh, on your roadmap, then and you have the, the trust that a person without any background knowledge of your domain can do it, I think then it's the right time to look for an outsourcing partner. That's at least our limited experience. I'm not very experienced in selecting outsourcing partners, but yeah, if I, if I can answer that question to my little limited experience, I would say I look for a partner that really understands your domain and is triggered by your domain. That would be my, my suggestion in general. Answers really helpful, interesting. You have great experience in your domain, in your industry. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. It was amazing chatting and it was a pretty efficient episode. Thank you for having me and good luck. If you enjoy our discussion and want to stay updated on the future episodes, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you will not miss out on the latest insights and conversations from the Devico Breakfast Bar. See you in the next episode.